So, uh, welcome to our webinar participants and to those viewers. And uh, we will mark today the 80 years uh, uni anniversary or since Nazi Germany invaded the Soviet Union. And we want to draw the lessons of history, just referring to that event which happened 80 years ago. So on the night from 21st to 22nd June, where operation of Nazi Germany, codenamed Operation Barbarossa, started. Operation Barbarossa opened the Eastern Front in Europe, the largest of the entire World War II, which witnessed some of its fiercest battles and worst atrocities until Nazi Germany capitulation in May 1945. The Soviet Union incurred the highest number of casualties during World War II. So more than 27 million people, half of whom were civilian. One million people have died during blockade of Leningrad. Soviet civilians in areas under Nazi occupation were subjected to brutal and arbitrary killings. Nazi racial ideology targeted both Jews and slaves millions of whom were executed or sent to concentration camps. The Wehrmacht captured around 5.7 million Soviet prisoners of war, of whom 3 million died in captivity. In uh, my family, uh, 22nd June was the day when my parents the students in Leningrad and met announcement of the war there. Uh, my Jewish great great parents were in Riga, and uh, after of the outbreak of the war, my father, a naval officer, fought in the Baltic. Mom remained in besieged Leningrad. All members of a large Jewish family in Latvia were exterminated in the Holocaust, together with 80,000 of Latvian Jews. That is a short story of how my family uh, suffered under on the, on the Nazi in, invasion to the Soviet Union and also fight it against. And, uh, the victory came in May 45, and the biggest happiness for us is in 75 years after victory and 80 years after beginning of the war to hear from eyewitnesses and active participants of this event. So our honorable guests are World War II veterans, veterans of anti-Hitler coalition. And uh, I will switch now to Russian, since we will speak, uh, our first guest will speak Russian. Итак, я хочу представить нашего первого гостя. So I would like to present our first guest, the veteran of anti-Hitler coalition, Alexander Asopian. Who lives in Latvia? Alexander Asopian was born in 1930. He was 11 when the war began. And he participated in that war and he was victorious. Alexander Georgievich, we would like to hear from you your story of how you faced the war. You were son of a regiment, but you were just 11, you were so young, and how you reached Vienna, and you've seen during the war other European cities, we would like to listen to you, and for that I'm giving the floor to you. 
It's horrible for me to speak about when the war started, but we children were like all other children, the way I remember all other children. It was horrible. It was frightening, but we all wanted to, to fight. You see, now, when you think about it, you just think about it. I was 12 in 1942, just 12 in my 13th year of life. But I was lucky because my friend and I escaped from an orphanage in Orjanikidze in the Stavropol region and uh, there was an evacuation from there and together we, we understood that probably uh, they were trying to evacuate people from the military routes and we spent a night with my friend on a train and when we got off the train on the stop we saw that they were forming a regiment there and my friend was very gifted boy he sung beautifully and i was dancing at the time the um, caucasian dance and some other dances as well and this was in june or july something like that in the summer and we sort of stuck with that group of the military and in 42, General Milayev saw us somewhere in the headquarters and he said, is it a kindergarten? And the head of staff said, no, these are fighters, these are great guys. But the general said, send them back to the east, to the home front. And two soldiers soldiers who were active in the military intelligence accompanied us he, they told us it's too it's too early for you the children and the winter is approaching you should go back east but when was that it was in 1942 at the end of 1942 but we escaped once again, and uh, once again, we found our unit. And when we arrived there, the Communist Party secretary of the unit was a woman, and she said, I'm going to take care of, that, of them. I'm going to look after them. And the head of staff said, I also don't feel like sending them away, but I'm just afraid that they would be going where they shouldn't be going. And uh, at the end, there was a guy, one of the military guys, it seems uh, he was an Ukrainian and he spoke with this typical Ukrainian accent. And uh, he said, if once again somebody will ask you about it, you'll say that you bring luck. So this is how this first surgeon, master surgeon, helped us. And then we were surrounded. And then we heard about Paulus's army being surrounded near Stalingrad, in Stalingrad. And then everybody remembered that I bring luck. And then the head of staff said, 
we should sew some appropriate, good, solid clothes for you. And this is what we got. It was beautiful. And uh, we followed the military units to Romania. And in Romania, we actually, we needed rest at the time. And I still remember that public bath in Romania, because we had mites, we had lice. But this is normal thing, because everybody had lice. This was a war. And uh, Yugoslavia, I will remember it forever. They were whistling, they were singing, they called us little brothers, and we were all hugging each other. So, I was together with partisan in Subotica, and then there was the town of Bai. In Yugoslavia, they called it Dunai, but the Magyars, Hungarians, called it Bai. And Hungarians Чехословакии очень запомнилась мне Вена. Утром, утром, рано, рано мы. I remember. Vienna extremely well. Early in the morning, our tanks entered Vienna and then we followed them and the first buildings were damaged. And uh, the captain said somebody should stay in the kitchen and there was a room there and uh, there was a woman with a daughter and a son and they were shaking with fear. And uh, the, uh, I was said, uh, just hug the children. They are frightened. They have been frightened by fascists, by the Germans. And the woman all of a sudden said, in this sort of broken Russian, but he said, we're not Germans, we're Austrians. And uh, when everybody started hugging each other, they sort of were revived by that. And uh, once when I spoke about it, and I spoke about this case, when the war was over, we finished uh, actually the war in Czechoslovakia. And from the station, of Brno, we were taken by train to the Far East, we crossed Mongolia, Halkin Gol, Halkin, and uh, Halkin Gol, this is a step, and we crossed that dry step settlements where every 40 or 50 kilometers our horses didn't survive that trip. So we were trying to catch wild horses and um, using them. And uh, the main thing was to find uh, and catch the leader of uh, this horses. Then then the 
leader of that, of a herd of horses, would lead all other horses. So then we had to eat horse meat as well. And I can tell you, I was rather brave at the time. And uh, unfortunately, I missed something very important. My friend was killed by a mine. It was in Romania, and uh, I remained alone. They didn't even allow me to bury him. They said, this is not a site for children. And they understood that there was another guy from Chechnya. And then I understood when I became an adult. Maybe... Maybe my friend did not die. Maybe they thought he was another Chechen and he was evacuated, sent into exile. And in 1950s, 60s, I thought about it and uh, I still think about it sometimes. I hope maybe he remained alive. So I remained alone and then I was on that horse that sort of took me away and I had to hold to the horse and then all of a sudden the horse stopped abruptly and I fell over its head three or four meters in front of the horse and the horse started chewing grass so very slowly I crawled to the horse and held the horse and I started caressing the horse so then when others reached me they said so this horse can be tamed but for some reason the horse got frightened at some point so when we forced Halkin Hall in Manjuria. Once again, we were called captains, captains, and they all addressed to me as twice captain, captain, captain. So this was the end of the Second World War for me when it was over with the Japanese. This is all I could say in brief. After the war, I ended up in Irkutsk because from Manjuria, soldiers were sent home, demobilized, and I remember they were getting sugar, several meters of silk, fabric, and maybe some other things, and uh, they were, they went home. But several soldiers and me, they sent to Irkutsk, and they gave me a pipe, so that, but they gave just a half pipe and asked me to whistle into it, but obviously, I didn't succeed at becoming a musician and they asked them to send me to school, to do my schooling. And I have the address, the contacts of uh, the head of staff in the region of Kharkov in Volchansk. And when I arrived there, I went to the uh, military committee and I said, where's that address? And uh, they told me that the family of that head of staff left. His family had been informed that he had died, but he was actually wounded and in the hospital. There was a mistake. And his wife left. And when he finally arrived home, they informed him that his wife left for Kuban, she was a Cossack, and he also left, he followed them. So they sent me to their kolkhoz, named after Ilyich, and uh, 
I was in the custody of that caucus. But um, how did you get to Riga? You know, we are run out of time a little bit. We are giving you only 10 minutes. And I know that maybe it's difficult for you to speak. It's extremely hot in Riga today. So thank you so much. We are very grateful to you. And we congratulate you with the fact that you survived and you can share your memories with us. And uh, I'm sure we'll be able to listen to you on many other occasions as well. And uh, you really crawled and marched through the whole of Europe, as they sing in the Russian song, but not just Europe, but also Manchuria. These are incredible memories, but here we spoke about infantry, but the next... Uh, so our second guest is a Navy officer, Mr. Baden Hall from UK. He was uh, born earlier than, than Mr. Asopian uh, at 1926. And uh, he is a member of Arctic convoys and he served on Zodiac, a Royal Navy destroyer. Uh, I'm very happy to hear Mr. Hall from you, your memories, I witnesses of your battles you participated. For me personally, it's very interesting since my father, he was also a Navy officer and after the war he served in the north in Arkhangelsk while during the war in Baltics. So I'm very happy to hear from you, your witness of how it has happened, Arctic convoys. Please switch your, you can speak. I hope your microphone is on. I can't see me though, can I? Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, we see you and we hear you. Hello. Good Hi. afternoon. Yes, I served on Russian convoys when I was 18. I'm now 96. And the first time I knew we was going to Russia, I was at Scapa Flow in the Orkneys in the Royal Navy. And after five miles out to sea, we were told where we were going. It took us 10 days to get to Russia. Of course, in the summer, it wasn't too bad. The weather was nice, but in the winter, it was terrible. Fog, rain, ice and snow, of course. And that pushed us further down to the Russian, to the Norwegian shore. So, of course, we was easy targets. But in the summer, you could go north the weather had got better. But then, of course, the, the submarines could operate, which they couldn't in the winter, really, because the seas were too rough. And, uh, of course, the, wet, the nights were light and the, the winter dark, and that was terrible. The conditions were terrible in the winter, in bad in the summer, but in the winter it was terrible. It took us nearly 10 days to get there, and when we got there, we got to Poliano. That's where we docked at Poliano. The boys, young boys, come alongside and ask us if we'd got any woolen clothing, gloves, socks, anything. They were so cold. And when we got there and landed ashore, the Russians weren't very pleased to see us, really. But I could understand afterwards had been knocked about so bad, it was terrible conditions. And after the little while, of course, that improved. And of course, coming back was just as hard as going. And coming back was the last time the Royal Navy ship was sunk. 
It was HMS Goodall. It was sunk in Cola Bay, and they didn't know whether a mine had been dropped at night or whether it was a torpedo. But of course, we couldn't hang around because there was no survivors much. And if a merchant ship got sunk, we had to leave it there. We didn't stop. We lost many, many men. We lost 3,000 plus men. It was very, very rough. But afterwards, they seemed to improve a bit uh, towards us, the Russians. I think they could see what we were doing, a good job, and taking lots of stuff up there. And uh, we got on very well with them afterwards. And uh, when we got back, it was just as bad as I say. We were very, very pleased to see the Scottish coastline once we got back. <laughs> you can imagine that. But uh, it, was, it was a rough job. It was rough, very rough. And Winston Churchill said it was the worst trip, worst journey of the war, it was the Russian convoys. Yes. So, uh, yeah, we, we wasn't entertained much, of course. But after the war, when we got down to uh, St. Petersburg, that's when we really appreciated, they really appreciated us. We stopped at uh, Murmansk, of course. I don't think we could get into Murmansk the first time because the docks had been knocked about so bad, there was no room for us. So that's why we had to stop at Poliano. And that's a few miles north of uh, Manx. And yes, um, what else is there to say about that? About the weather, of course. Terrific. Cold. We're not used to the cold like that. Not here, not in England. We're not used to that cold. Uh, and people from here, they make trips now to see the northern lights which of course we saw them regular. We didn't have to pay for that. Yes. And uh, I don't know what else to say about them, but the terrible conditions. Terrible. But since then, since then, I've had several trips back to Russia. Appreciation. St. Petersburg, uh, Archangel, and of course back to Pollyanna. Not Pollyanna, because that's a a, a submarine base, a secret no, base. No, eh? Sorry, we can't hear you. We've lost contact. Yeah, we've lost contact now. Switched out. Sorry. Do you hear me? Yes, we I can hear. now, yes. Yeah, yeah. I, I have heard. So, sorry, my question is, you have visited St. Petersburg, but which other north, north, northern cities? Have you visited Murmansk? I was recently in Arkhangelsk, there is a monument, very nice monument to Arctic convoys. In St. Petersburg? No, no, in Murmansk. In Arkhangelsk. Ah, I haven't seen that one, but I've seen the one in St. Petersburg. We were there when they unveiled that. And my daughter, come with me, went as a family, and my daughter laid a wreath on that one at St. Petersburg. That's beautiful. But I haven't seen the one that moved. I've never been back to my bank since. That was the only time. But uh, St. Petersburg, yes, lovely. They took us to the opera and everything. Really, a good it. job. Thank you, yeah. Saw Swan Lake there. Yes. Okay, Mr. Hall. We are very, very thankful that you participate are participating in our talk yes. in our conversation. Maybe yes. you you want to say something on just actual situation and uh, tensions between West and Russia. What would you like to say to us, to generation of your children, after war-born people? I'd have to talk to him and tell him what you said. He couldn't quite hear that. If okay, could, maybe would... you can you can say some words. 
I, I guess it, it's Mrs. Hall. It is. it is, yes, yes. I'm just sitting at the side of my husband to try and sort of help, but let me just pop that on there. That's yeah, it. greetings. <laughs> Welcome. It is Welcome. to see you and lovely to meet you. Uh, yeah. So greetings from Brussels, where I am myself here. We had Riga, you, you saw, and uh, we have people in Moscow, in Bratislava, in London. So we, we will continue our webinar, our conversation, and I hope you will hear interventions of participants of our webinar and good health for you both and we are very happy that in your 96 you are capable to, to well, meet you. us and to share your experience your memories yes it's lovely thank and thank you very much for inviting Baden to be partake in this because it's a great honor really to be able to yeah. talk and to talk and he does get a little bit sort of you know uptight when he talks about the war things and that but uh, i would just like to say one thing it doesn't really but he was saying that we go back we have been back to st petersburg and also other places but i would like to just say how welcome everybody has made us feel when we go back to russia to see the people and uh the monuments that have been put up etc and also we are connected up with a cambridge to cambridge with a russian speaking society and we are great friends with the russian people there in cambridge so it's very nice that we are still all connected up together and friends yes. Yes, thank you very much. I know that uh, your association of veterans of Arctic convoys uh, yes. normally meet regularly, especially in the Victory Day. Yes, yes. yes. So, so okay. thank you very much for for speaking to us, and uh, we stay with us, please. And uh, I we will now discuss modern problems and nowadays politics since yes. and how the lessons of history can influence uh, to modern politics which is uh, in very bad situation uh, to be honest uh, relations between west and uh, russia and uh, i am representing also, also latvia country being a member of European Union and bordering with Russia and having 40% of native Russian speakers and uh, very much also thinking how to ameliorate understanding and mutual understanding and relations. And uh, for this, I was very, very carefully followed what was told on the occasion of this uh, 80 years after Germany invaded Soviet Union. And first of all, of course, what was said in Berlin. And uh, I have read the commemorating statements of uh, German President Frank Walter Steinmeier as well of all representatives of all political groups in German Bundestag. And uh, I have to say that I appreciate all the words spoken by these politicians. They all uh, said that the suffering of the former Soviet people I am citing should be burned into Germany's collective memory. And in particular, the German president, Mr. Steinmeier, stated, I'm citing, only those who learn to read the traces of the past in the present will be able to contribute to a future that avoids wars, rejects tyranny, and enables peaceful coexistence in freedom. Bracket closed. But 
I have asked myself whether all top politicians in Germany have learned to read the traces of the past in the present. And I have to address to the statement of German Chancellor Angela Merkel, who made her video podcast on Saturday. And uh, she called the Nazi invasion of the Soviet Union, I'm citing, an occasion for shame, an occasion for shame. These are very emotional and very honest words. But if Mrs. Merkel should put the point after this definition, an occasion for shame, but she did not. She considered it necessary to immediately start giving lessons to Russia and Belarus, criticizing the ongoing crackdown against political opposition figures. Uh, these are her words and civil society and uh, her last words were as follows for germany and the eu the situation was unacceptable these are words of mrs merkel so the situation was acceptable for germany and the eu but who has appointed Germany and the EU to the roles of judges and teachers? Uh, just few facts. First of all, on Germany it, it, itself. Just uh, some days ago, on June 16th, four Bundeswehr soldiers from NATO mission were exported from Lithuania for anti-Semitic songs and harassment. We know that two member states of the European Union, Poland and Hungary, are under ongoing infringement procedure for rule of law violation, violation by governing parties, just ignoring democratic principles. If we return back to Lithuania, for example, a book of Ruta Vanagait, a Musiskiai, our people in English, a travelogue about the Holocaust consisting of interviews with witnesses to the atrocities perpetrated by Lithuanians against the Jewish neighbors, was forbidden for sale, forbidden by the state. The very same examples for, to my regret, are taking place, can be withdrawn from Latvian, Latvian experience, my own countries. Uh, for many years, the 16th of March, the day when the soldier of Latvian SS Legion are publicly commemorated, uh, they are going to the Victory Monument in the center of Riga and uh, Party, National Alliance, Coalition Party, entering in the government, organized a flag alley at the Freedom Monument. Uh, two last years, this procession did not take place because of COVID restrictions, but the very same party organized the film production. The title is Latvian Legion in the Light of Truth. Uh, and uh, they recommended to use this film in school curricula. The heroes are Latvian legioners. And in particular, movie chronicles show up uh, where Latvian legioners uh, consult hearsley with the high ranking curfew in which we can recognize friedrich ecken the ss obergruppenführer friedrich ecken filled the function of ss and police chief in Ostland. he led the sale of holocaust and other mass exhibit in German occupied areas, including Kiev, Babi Yar, 
including the sale of the mass of Riga Geta residents in Rumbula. There my great great parents are lying. And he and the people around him in this film are shown by a positive light. And when I wrote the letter to the security, to the prosecutor general to or initiate the case against this uh, authors, films authors, the refusal came. So that is the situation. And the which, so I don't think that good teachers for Russia and Belarus and uh, other Eastern former Soviet republics are just uh, people from countries I have mentioned. And if we speak about lessons of history to be drawn out of this uh, Mrs. Merkel's uh, statement and uh, likewise statements, it is uh, the, the, the following one. The, I think that the mistake that people should not repeat is just humiliation of the dignity of other people and of other nations and the appropriation of the right to judge other nations. We know that just uh, historians are saying that the main failure of Hitler was that he absolutely did not understand with whom he would like to fight before 22nd of June 40, 1941. And he did not understand the real scale of his opponent and his ideas about the Soviet people and the processes that took place in the USSR uh, from the moment of its foundation until the outbreak of World War II were extremely primitive. Uh, that is everything that he was told about uh, an unworthy, stupid mess that groans under the yoke of wild Jewish blood suckers. These are his words. All this, in principle, was part of not only propaganda but Hitler's thinking and thinking of the elite that surrounded him was also the same they themselves believed in it and they believed that the judeo-bolsheviks were simply exploiting this uneducated mess and uh, accordingly it will be very easy to war with uh, to go to war against soviet union since people are, they are badly educated and suffering under judeo-bolsheviks power History showed that it was not the case, and they were battled. And uh, I, that is my remark on what we have heard during these days on uh, commemorating 80th anniversary of beginning of Eastern Front battle. And uh, I would like to hear from other participants of our webinar which ones are lessons for them and first person whom i propose to take the floor is his excellency vladimir chizhov ambassador extraordinary and plenty potentiary of russia to the european union mr chizhov floor is yours i don't know which language you will speak english or russian please if you can hear me well, I'm going to speak Russian then. I would like to start with the words of gratitude to Ms. Zdanok for organizing today's conference. And I know that her memories of the Great Patriot War uh, is associated with personal losses. Your grandparents were in the Riga Geta and uh, in autumn 1941 were killed by the local Zonter command 
circulated joined the Latvian volunteer SS Legion and I understand how difficult it is for you today to watch the marches of uh, former legionnaires and Latvian nationalists that take place in Riga every year on the 16th of March and I know how much effort you're putting into fighting this shameful phenomenon Minan, and I wish you courage and fortitude in this endeavor. Dear colleagues, the 22nd of June for citizens of Russia and other former Soviet republics is a very special date. A horrible, dreadful war began on that day that brought misery and grief to every family, every home. Victory. For victory, the Soviet people had to pay an enormous price. It cost the lives of 27 million of our citizens. And it will always be commemorated as a holiday with tears in our eyes. That day has been imprinted forever in the minds and DNA of our people. And I may say that it became one of the unifying pillars of modern Russia. This is why today's attempt to revise the history of the Second World War and question the decisive contribution of the Soviet people to the liberation of Europe from the Brown Lake is viewed in our country with such pain. Practically from the moment I was appointed as the Russia's permanent representative to the EU in 2005, I had to witness how this process was gaining momentum and in front of my eyes the revisionist aspirations, I must say, of not the, the largest or the most uh, influential EU countries and politicians were growing steadily into a targeted campaign. And the culmination of that was the adoption on the 19th of September 2019 of the resolution on the importance of European remembrance for the future of Europe by the European Parliament. This document became the quintessence of the pseudo-historical revisionist concepts promoted in the EU today, aiming at equating Nazism and communists and placing equal responsibility for unleashing the Second World War on both Nazi regime and who was recognized as criminal by the Nuremberg Tribunal and the Soviet Union, one of the main participants of the anti, anti Hitler coalition and one of the founders of the United Nations. At the same time, they're trying to blame us for signing the Treaty of Non-Aggression with Germany on the 23rd of August 1939, which Europe prefers to call the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. So they are claiming that it divided Europe between two totalitarian regimes and paved the path to the Second World War, the European Union has even been de declared, uh, the European Union has even declared the 23rd of August, the so-called Europe-wide Day of Remembrance for the victims of all totalitarian and authoritarian regimes and commemorates the date with annual statements, drawing parallels between the USSR and Nazi Germany. I will not go into the background of uh, the soviet german non-aggression treaty i will leave that to historians but i would also to i would also only like to remind you that this step was necessitated by the realities of the time which was preceded by the policy of appeasement of nazi germany uh, it culminated in the infamous munich conspiracy of 1938 which actually triggered the countdown to the outbreak of the Second World War, giving the aggressor free hand. And I, it should be worth mentioning that USSR applied all efforts to create a viable system of collective security in Europe in the pre-war period and leaving aside that the Soviet Union was by far not the only state to conclude a non-aggression pact with Germany, Poland, Great Britain, France and a number of other countries, including Baltic states, had similar agreements. But 
the modern Europe does not like to remind people about these facts. And sometimes I have a feeling that today the Soviet Union is being a, that others are taking revenge on the Soviet Union for the prescient time its leadership managed to buy to prepare the country for the war, which coupled with heroism and fortitude of the Soviet people enabled it to survive that confrontation. Now, at the same time, political efforts in Western and a number of West European countries have launched a complaint to combat monuments and memorials erected to honor Red Army soldiers who gave their lives fighting for the liberation of these countries from the Nazis. And their mentioned above the resolution of the European Parliament of 2019 explicitly condemns the existence of monuments and memorials glorifying totalitarian regimes. Some countries go even further and are already openly erecting monuments in honor of Nazi collaborators and Nazis. Disrespectful, blasphemous attitude towards the memory of liberators is being spread among the population. Just recently, we could hardly imagine this being possible. And what's more remarkable, most of the countries seeing such development have actually survived on the political map of Europe only as a result of the victory of the anti-Hitler coalition over Nazi Germany with the decisive contribution of the Soviet Union. And many of these countries were liberated by the Red Army at tremendous cost. The words uh, by Marshal Ivan Konev are, when I visit the Olshane Cemetery in Prague, where the ashes of our soldiers and officers who died during the Prague operation are buried, it makes me sad to read the date 9th of May on the tombstones decorated with flowers. The war was practically over. And these people died here on the outskirts of Prague when the whole country was already celebrating victory. I would like to remind you that the Marshal Konev's forces came to aid the people of Prague on the 5th of May 1945. The people of Prague rebelled on that day and it's Konev's forces that saved the city from destruction and altogether in the territory of Czechoslovakia, nowadays Czech Republic and Slovakia, about 140,000 Red Army soldiers and officers were killed there. And 75 years later, defendants of the inhabitants of Prague who greeted their liberators with flowers and cheers dismantled the Conniff Monument in the Czech capital. And I cannot but mention statements of the heads of European institutions that we regularly hear on remembrance dates of the World War II on the Holocaust Memorial Day on the 27th of January, the day the Soviet troops rebuilt, liberated the Auschwitz concentration camp. They deliberately omit that it was the Red Army who opened the gates of the Nazi death machine. Brussels prefers to reduce it to the term allied forces. Of course, these terminologies against the backdrop of these allegedly inadvertent errors in tweets by the US Embassy in Denmark and the, and the weekly Der Spiegel assuring their readers in 2020 that Auschwitz had been liberated by the U.S. troops. This is not so critical, but this has little, little to do with the presenting history objectively. Dear colleagues, just deliberate distortion of the historical facts creates a climate of, in, of tolerance for blatant propaganda of Nazi ideas. And unfortunately, this case, both in, the num in a number of EU member states and in certain post-Soviet countries, in particular Ukraine, we have to state that the immunity to the brown plague that was developed in Nuremberg is wearing off. And this threatens fundamental principles of democracy and human rights. It insults the memory of millions of victims of the Second World War 
and those who gave their lives for the liberation of Europe from Nazism. The Nuremberg Tribunal judgment clearly and unambiguously qualified those responsible for this bloodiest war in history. And we assume that the full recognition of the results of the World War II, uh, which included uh, among others in the UN Charter, is an unconditional imperative for all states. And we are convinced that a systemic work on countering the any expressions, manifestations of racism, xenophobia, aggressive nationalism, and chauvinism must remain among the utmost priorities of the international community. And, and the annual um, initiated by Russia resolution uh, combating, on combating glorification of Nazism, neo Nazism, and other practices that contribute to fueling contemporary forms of racism, racial discrimination, xenophobia, and related intolerance by the UN general assessment. It is traditionally supported by an overwhelming majority of the states of the United Nations. Dear colleagues, in 2020, the provision on having to protect historical truth about our homeland, including the Great Patriotic War, was engraved in the Russian Constitution. And I promise that we will continue to consistently uphold the memory of our great victorious ancestors. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Yeah, Your Excellency, yes, and uh, I'm going to switch to English. to English to represent our next speaker and very enjoyable guest. Thank you very much, Mr. Metlock, Ambassador of United States in uh, Moscow in very important years, uh, 1987 to 1991. You are representing, uh, represented the state part of anti-Hitler coalition together with uh, Soviet Union, Britain, and uh, okay, France, uh, it's question for historians, but uh, and Mr. Metlock, you were guest of uh, our European Russian Forum in Brussels in 2014. To our regret, there were technical problems for travel, but still you spoke to us and uh, we have also printed your printed speech in two languages. And we are very, very happy that you agreed to join us today and you have the floor please how do you estimate which lessons have we to withdraw from history of 80 years old please. thank you very much for the invitation to participate i was still just a student in, in secondary school uh, when the Second World War started, and then when Nazi Germany invaded the Soviet Union. I did follow things in the news very closely, and this was one of the events that began to stimulate me to study the Russian language, Russian history, and later to serve as a diplomat. I think that looking back, we should have understood, uh, even after the First World War, that attempts to take by force other countries uh, is not something that is going to benefit anyone. And in fact, we should have learned that you do not solve human problems by using force. Of course, this turned out to be a disaster for everybody in terms of lives lost and so on. Then toward the end of World War II, we entered the nuclear age. And this was one of the great motivating factors that I had as a university student 
understanding that if there were a nuclear war, mankind would probably not survive. Certainly civilized life would become impossible. And yet we went through an arms race based mainly on ideology. And uh, this became extremely dangerous. Finally, in the 1980s, uh, the United States and its allies and uh, Mikhail Gorbachev, Soviet Union, began to recognize the threat. And in their first meeting between President Reagan and then General Secretary Gorbachev, they made a statement. A nuclear war cannot be won and must never be fought. And then that added, in effect, that means there can be no war between us. And that was the basis that we began to seek those areas where it was in our interest to cooperate and to dampen the competitive urges, uh, which were going to benefit nobody. And I think that one of the things that most people under, misunderstand is that there was no victory of the West over the Soviet Union in the Cold War. We negotiated an end in the interests of both countries, and in fact, in all countries. And the idea that somehow uh, the end of the Cold War uh, was uh, was something that the Soviet Union lost uh, is not true. Also, the idea that the uh, that the breakup of the Soviet Union was a result of Western pressure gets it backwards. The Cold War had ended before the Soviet Union broke up, and the Soviet Union broke up not because the United States or NATO or the West was pressing it to break up, but because of internal pressures. And as a matter of fact, uh, President Bush uh, did not want the Soviet Union to break up. Of course, we Americans wanted the three Baltic countries to regain their independence. We never recognized they were part of the Soviet Union but we really hope to live with a voluntary federation of the sort that Gorbachev was trying to create. Uh, obviously, we were not the determining factors there, but the idea that somehow the breakup of the Soviet Union was a victory for the West was not something shared by our political leaders at that time. And I think this needs to be understood. Finally, I would simply say I th think it is tragic that our countries still are thinking in terms of using force, uh, of trying to somehow extend uh, their domination of uh, parts of the world uh, by threat of force or, or so on. I think that is simply going to be tragic if we continue it. We all have a shared interest in very, very important dangers. First of all, we're still in the middle of a pandemic which we have not solved and we will not solve until we cooperate. As long as, as the uh, epidemic is anywhere in the world, it's going to threaten us all. And why we don't concentrate more on that, on the cooperation rather than backbiting and, and arguing over who's doing what best, uh, I don't know. Second, of course, we face the tremendous challenge of environmental degradation, global warming, and environmental degradation in, indeed. This is also something that we must cooperate to find ways to deal with. And then the global warming that even if we take efforts is going to continue uh, for some time. We'll be faced with migrations, uh, with refugees from areas that are hit harder, uh, 
tremendous things which we will not solve by uh, by confronting each other and making life difficult for each other. And so I would simply say, uh, let us look back and try to understand better how we ended uh, the confrontations during the Cold War by finding areas to cooperate and begin to concentrate on those areas rather than those areas where we differ, because those areas where we differ are much less important to our security uh, than those where our interests are the same. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Matlock. And uh, I guess uh, the questions and the answers session after interventions. Yeah, and uh, I would be very happy just to ask you a question on how much differences and on important issues are in approaches just to continue your idea but now i i don't know in which language the next speaker will intervene uh, but uh, i continue in english to give the floor to mr vyacheslav nikonov who is a member of uh, russian House of Representatives in Russian, Russian Duma, Russian Duma, and head of the Committee on uh, uh, Education and uh, Research, and a lot of other novelties. But Mr. Nikon, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Tatiana. If you continue in English, I'll continue in English. I have no way out. Uh, uh, I, first of all, I'd like to say uh, that I'm uh, glad to see you all and to hear you all in good health. Twenty uh, second of June is an important day to remember World War II, which, in my mind, deserves uh, serious analysis. Still, we think we know everything about the war, but it looks like uh, that's not true. For example, why? Uh, is it so that we consider September 1st to be the beginning of World War II? Why? Why September 1st? What happened September 1st? Maybe it's a date which is taken by everybody all over the world? No, because the Japanese, for example, uh, speak about 15 year uh, war which started in 1931. The Chinese officially start World War II in July 1937. In the Soviet Union, people were speaking about the ongoing Second World War in mid 30s. And, you know, uh, maybe we, it's World War II started September, in September because the uh, you know, the territory captured by the aggressor was much bigger than before? Actually not, because by the beginning of 1932, the Japanese captured over a million square kilometers of Chinese territory, which is three and a half times bigger than the territory of Poland. Uh, maybe the casualties uh, in, in the war started to grow after uh, September 1st. Actually not. Because by the 1st of September, 1939, there were 20 million, 20 million, literally, Chinese citizens killed by the Japanese. And by that day, there were also half a million Ethiopians killed by Italians, and there were a million and a half Spaniards killed in what I think was the Second World War. So uh, why then September 1st? Well, uh, first of all, because that was the privilege of the two great colonial European powers to call it World War. That was France and the United Kingdom. They entered the war, they, uh, though they didn't shoot a bullet, but they were there and that it was the start of a world war. 
who cares about those 20 million Chinese, you know, half a million Ethiopians or, or leftist Spaniards. Uh, and second reason why was because it was easy to accuse the Soviet Union for starting the war. Uh, the logic is simple. On August 23rd, uh, they signed the uh, Russian-German uh, non-aggression pact, and September 1st, the war starts. So after, that means because of. That's the logic we see now in the European Parliament uh, and around in many European countries, which is absolutely false logic, actually, because, you know, uh, by then, uh, the world war was already going on. Maybe it was because the great powers entered the war. Uh, actually not. Uh, the United States were not at war. Uh, the Soviet Union was fighting uh, the Japanese and uh, it was supporting the Spaniards, but it was not officially in war. So the war actually became the World War only in 1941. Uh, thinking otherwise is somewhat racist, I would say, and of course very Eurocentric. Uh, that was the World War which started actually in Asia by Japan. The war in Africa was started by Italians. And only three countries in the world did not recognize the uh, uh, absorption of uh, Ethiopia into Italian empire. These were the Soviet Union, China, and the United States of America. And of course, in Sp the war in Europe started in Spain back in 1936. Uh, and Russia was uh, actually one of the few countries, not the only country which was really supporting the anti-Nazi forces. When people speak about what were the reasons for World War II, they oftentimes uh, point at Russia, imperialists and so on. Russia was not imperialist. Uh, the World War II was actually uh, uh, initiated by the uh, system of Versailles which was, in my mind, a creation of the Western world and was the starter, the starting point of, of, the, of the World War II, because it made Germany uh, strong enough uh, to have the army. And uh, of course, it could not make any German recognize that, that the this, uh, this system of Versailles was just. Then there was a, a Great Depression initiated in the United States, uh, which caused sufferings in many countries and caused the uh, accession of Nazis to power in, the, in Germany and in Japan. And those were the forces that started the war. Russia had nothing to do to the system of Versailles. And it had nothing to do with the Great Depression. Actually, uh, Russia was the only country which did not suffer uh, the Great Depression. As for the Western democracies, for many years, they were pursuing uh, this uh, strategy of appeasement of aggressors, just trying to uh, uh, forward the German aggression against, against the Soviet Union. Of course, Moscow would prefer an alliance with Western democracies because of like Germany, they were not uh, interested in, in killing every single Russian, as Hitler stated in Mein Kampf. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, and the Soviet Union proposed such cooperation many, many times. But I, sh I should like to stress that uh, uh, Mr. Deladier and Chamberlain, they were meeting Hitler several times. They had direct communication with Hitler. They signed many agreements with Hitler. They never bothered to make a phone call to Stalin. They never bothered to write a single letter to Stalin. Why? Because the Soviet Union was considered to be not worth talking to of decent powers. Hitler was. Soviet Union was not. As for Poland, I think uh, uh, the Poland has chosen its fate. It preferred to be a, a semi-ally of Germany. Germany, which wanted to conquer it. It preferred to have Soviet Union as the enemy, the Soviet Union, which was capable and eager to save Poland. And they had as, as their uh, last minute partners, uh, uh, England and France, which were not eager or capable of helping them. 
And the United States were in splendid isolation. Uh, they were not interested in the uh, affairs of corrupt Europe, uh, uh, of corrupt European colonial powers. Uh, and uh, they were neutral, but it turned out that they supported Nazi Germany and Japan economically much more than the victims uh, of aggression. So uh, the Soviet German pact was signed only uh, after the negotiations with France and, and uh, the United Kingdom uh, were, uh, went nowhere because those two countries sent to Moscow low, of, uh, low level officials with no uh, authority to sign any agreement. And everyone knew that the war is to start in a few days. So for Moscow at this point, it was important to understand where the German forces will stop. Will it be Warsaw or Minsk or Moscow or maybe Vladivostok? We need to know that. And uh, the Soviet Union needed uh, some time to prepare for war. And they used this time properly. The Soviet Union doubled its uh, military production in two years. Uh, well, uh, so Germany attacked Poland, and that was just yet another bloody episode in the war, which has been going on for many, many years. By that time, millions and millions of people died, and four countries already disappeared from the map. Austria, Ethiopia, Czechoslovakia, and Albania by the beginning of, of the world war, uh, amazingly. And of course, Britain and France had no will, no resources uh, to uh, assure the guarantees it presented to Poland. And the world war will become world war only after Hitler attacked uh, the Soviet Union and Japan attacked the United States and the United States entered the war. That's when it became the world war II. Uh, as for uh, accusations of the Soviet Union of unleashing the war, it's, it's absolutely groundless. Uh, Stalin uh, was not an, an angel, of course. Uh, he was not uh, uh, innocent, but unlike Lenin, he was not uh, interested in military uh, adventures or if uh, he was not a fan of the global revolution. He didn't plan any war on any revolution, and he was really very much afraid of the large scale military conflict. So the victims of the war, the uh, uh, real uh, people who are responsible for the war are in Tokyo and Berlin. That was stressed by the Nuremberg trial and the Tokyo process. As for the Soviet Union, I think if we compare it with other great powers, it was uh, pursuing a more decent policy than the rest. The uh, Soviet Union was the only country which accused every single act of aggression of Germany. The only country. It was the only country which proposed uh, real military help to the victims of aggression. The only country. It was the only country which was ready to fight with aggressors and who was really fighting, be it in Spain or in the Far East. Uh, by August 1938, uh, 39, th sorry, Soviet Union was the only country which had no deal with Germany, with Hitler, no pact with Hitler. And it will be the Soviet Union which will defeat 80% of the Nazi divisions. And so who are accusing the Soviet Union of unleashing the war? Uh, mostly the countries which were part of the Hitler coalition, which were part of Germany, which worked on Germans, or which were uh, actually captured by Germany. Of course, Wehrmacht by the time was the strongest military force uh, uh, of the planet, but it was not alone. Uh, uh, this day, 22nd of June, 1941, uh, the borders of the Soviet Union were crossed by 380,000 Romanians, 340,000 Finns, 62,000 Italians, 44,500 uh, Hungarians, 42,500 Slovakians, and one 
1,600 Croatians. As for uh, the uh, military production for Wehrmacht, it was used, uh, it, it, the military production, the military uh, hardware of Wehrmacht was produced at 4,876 foreign factories, including 271 Polish, 268 uh, Danish, 275 Norwegian, 640 uh, Dutch, uh, 1,880 Belgian, 1,442 French. I'm not speaking about the protectorate of Bohemia and Moravia, which became the major arsenal of Hitler arms, where 860 factories worked hard uh, till uh, May 5th, 1945. Besides, Wehrmacht got the armaments of 30 Czech divisions, 34 Polish divisions, 92 uh, French divisions, 12 British divisions, which they <laughs> left the arms when they were uh, 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 evacuating through Dunkirk. 22 Belgian divisions, uh, nine Dutch, and so on and so forth. You know, after, the, uh, after Brexit, in the European Union, you practically do not have any countries which were fighting Nazis. And those are the countries which are accusing the Soviet Union and now Russia, which actually won the greatest victory in the history of humankind over the, over the most uh, dangerous uh, enemy of humankind by the casualties, which were the biggest in the history of humankind. 27 million people, uh, Tatiana Zdanov said that half of them were civilians. That's not true. 18 million out of 27 were civilians. Women, children, old men, who were shot, burned alive, died in concentration camps, in gas cameras, who were dug in, in, in the ground alive. And now when they are eliminating the monuments to Soviet soldiers in Czech Republic and Poland, they do it to the monuments to all these people who were not only Russians, they were Ukrainians, they were Jews, they were Belarusians, they were Moldovans, they were Latvians, Lithuanians, Estonians, Georgians, Tatars, Ar 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 Azeris, uh, Kazakhs, Kyrgyz, and other people who lived in the Soviet Union then. These are the monuments to four million people Soviet Union lost while uh, liberating Europe. More than a million of them dead. Uh, actually, in Poland, we left 600,000 dead. In Czechoslovakia, as Mr. Ambassador said, 140,000. Uh, uh, in Hungary, the same. In Romania, 70,000. And over 100,000 people in Germany. So the monuments there, uh, eliminating, they're destroying now. These are the monuments to those people and to those who survived. And among that, them was my father, Captain Alexei Nikonov, who was in Prague, May 9th, 1945. He survived, Your Excellency. He was more lucky than those who died in Prague this day. And this is the truth which cannot be argued. Whatever they say, we will believe that this is the greatest victory ever uh, won by any country in the history of humankind. And that's why we think that for us, this memory of the great victory, of the great war, of the great cooperation we had at this war with our allies, with the United States, with the United Kingdom, with China.
this memory will live forever. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nikonov, and I immediately pass the floor to Senator Andrei Klimov, representing the Council of Federation and member of Foreign Affairs Committee and a co-chair of frozen delegation of interparliamentary relations between the European Parliament and Russia. Floor is yours, please. Uh Thank you very much indeed, but it seems to me that uh, at least one of two parliamentarians uh, should speak uh, Russian language. If you allow me to do that, I'll try to do my best. Uh, are you ready to understand Russian language now? Yes, of course. Thank you so much. I'm going to try and um, stop on the most important conclusions that, in my opinion, are necessary for all of us, all those who are situated in Brussels or in Moscow, or somewhere in the US, or in the Great Britain. The history doesn't know any conditional tenses or subjective moods. But nevertheless, there are still people who are trying to write history and they're trying to rewrite it not just to change something in the past. This is impossible. They're trying to rewrite it to change the future, to change the future of the projects that what they think will save the humanity. I'm, I beware of the people who are trying to save the humanity and try to form a new human. Hitler wanted to create a new, clean Aryan race. How he succeeded, we all know that. And one of the lessons, the most important lessons of our tragic history that for the Soviet Union, for my ancestors, began on the 22nd of June, 1941, is that one of the most serious dangers is to be governed by is extremists, the people who are penetrated, who are infected with extremist na Nazism, racism, they use the argument of democracy because Hitler was elected by the people, he came to power through the elections by the people and the extremists, Hitler became leader of Germany, which became fascist, and we all remember how it ended. And, um, the, in such, it is very strange that such a respectful place as the European Parliament is blaming us for not allowing to give access to power to extremists who 15 years ago were marching with extremist slogans in Moscow and demanding to chase away people of, the, of other nationalities and these are the people that are being supported by the European Parliament. I saw the results of the vote on the 15th of June. The support was shown to extremists and nationalism and here we speak about several hundred uh, MEPs who believe they are civilized people and are pulled by what Hitler was doing in the gas chambers. It's difficult to believe that because today we're trying to defend our country, our democracy against extremists, uh, racists, uh, nationalists, from those who are uh, trying to bring evil, not just to our people, but also to their mankind. And another conclusion that seems to be logical when we remember the lessons of the Second World War, and here I fully agree with my colleague, Mr. Nikonov, the war didn't start on the 1st of September, and now I'll have to leave you, unfortunately, because I'm going to meet the ambassador of China, and we're going to discuss a number of issues, including the issue pertaining to those who are trying to distort history. Our Chinese neighbors are speaking about, uh, rightfully speaking about, tens, dozens of millions of Chinese who died in that war, and their war began much earlier. And uh, we should remind about that to Europe, because sometimes Europe believes that the whole Europe is limited uh, by the borders of the European Union. They speak, we are Europe. In fact, the big enlarged Europe is almost to the waves of the Pacific Ocean. 
or as de, de Gaulle stated to the Urals Mountain. I don't know why they divided our country into two parts, but this is how it is. But when we speak about the global world, and we should be speaking about the global world now because of the world as a result of globalization and digital uh, technologies and modern armaments, uh, the world has become very fragile and we should not mix up the truth and the imaginary issues when we could meet face to face in serbia in belgrade i talked to some of my colleagues from france i'm not going to name them though i know all of them well and i'm sure they are well known in brussels as well and I asked them to sign a very simple short document on the necessity to consolidate all responsible democratic forces, at least in Europe, to ensure peace. And that's it. What could you, could one argue with? French colleagues proposed to me to add something to this provision, just half a sentence. So to provide a sustainable peace and the protection of LGBTI rights. I, frankly speaking, was a bit surprised and I, it took me in half an hour to try and explain to them that if we'll have the nuclear war, there won't be LGBTI. But they replied to me, why do we need peace and without LGBTI? This is the issue of when talking about values. So one thing is to fight uh, extremism, racism, not allow modern Hitlers to come to power. But on the other side, they're speaking about why do we need peace if there won't be any LGBTI communities. But in our country, LGBTI are not persecuted and they do whatever they like, but to, to create a correlation between the future of the mankind with the LGBTI, this is a reflection of rather um, complex and confused minds of my colleagues in Europe. And uh, one peace is one of uh, unquestionable values and it's threatened the meeting on the 16th of the summit on the 16th of june in geneva it demonstrates that because two world leaders said for us the global strategic sustainability is an absolute priority and we'll do everything or at least we'll try to do everything to prevent a non-intentional inadvertent third world war this is a great achievement we'll see what will happen in practice and here in russia we believe i am certain that that the main issues for providing peace for ensuring peace are just two of course there are more but first of all is the practice of interfering in domestic affairs of other countries Again, which goes against the provisions of the UN Charter. When an UN adopts a law in August 2017 where it calls Russia adversary, but it also adopts a whole plan of transforming our political system and uh, in accordance with that law, all NATO countries, all uh, OSCU and a number of other countries, including Ukraine, should be assisting the United States in that. And I don't know of a single European politician who uh, put a distance between himself and that plan, that law saying that they have to defend their own democratic system. So I don't know what you all think about it. So there negation of the Russian Federation that was engraved in the American law is now being implemented, but many, they're trying to do the same to China and a number of other countries, including in Latin America and also in Europe. Just would like to remind you what happened in the former Yugoslavia, we'll remember that well. So non-interference in domestic affairs. And the second issue is very important, the lack of direct, respectful dialogue between different religious cultures, 
ethnic groups. We, the Russian Federation, initiated this dialogue. We were supporters, the United Nations organizations, and in May 22, our country will receive, most likely in St. Petersburg, the World Conference on inter-ethnical, international, and inter-religious dialogue. And I hope that many of you will participate in that and will make a possible contribution to the implementation of real peace on the earth. And so that the lessons that caused more than 27 million lives to our country and those millions of lives to other countries would be uh, preserved to preserve the humanity. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Kleeman. And I think that for the participants of this webinar, it would be interesting to know that you were you were honored uh, the men a mention in the latest resolution of the European Parliament. I don't think it's going to be the last one. They uh, uh, they accuse me of professionally fighting racism and nationalism and fascism. So after having listened to two Russian members of parliament, representatives of the executive power in Russia, I would like to give the floor to a representative of Slovakia, MEP, Miroslav Radachovsky, who is uh, representing the European Parliament in the delegation in the Permanent uh, Cooperation Committee in EU Russia, whose activities were frozen. And we would like to ask him how he sees the lessons of the Second World War. and. Uh, he has his family has a particular history background his father was fighting in the ranks of the anti-hitler coalition forces i greet all participants of this meeting and uh, i congratulate you with this event and uh, first of all i would like to commemorate and to, to greet all, to express my respect to veterans of the whole world. And I'm son of a veteran of the Second World War. This is his photo. He's not among us any longer. He's died. My father fought as a Slovak in the ranks of the Red Army in Ukraine, in Russia, in Polish, Poland, and Czechoslovakia. He spoke a lot about the threats of that war. He, he spoke about killed women, men, and children. He liberated concentration camps. He spoke about assassinated Jews. And he said what we, that we should never forget what happened. And most European countries, together with Hitler, attacked the Soviet Union. Who is guilty? of the attack on the Soviet Union. From my point of view, the politicians who wanted to become hegemons of the world and of Europe, those who divided Europe, Western Europe and Eastern Europe, and most countries in Europe, together with Germany, attacked the Soviet Union, and they were persuaded that they put Russians on their knees, but they haven't succeeded. And I believe that it, they will never succeed. The Second World War began on the 22nd of June of 1941. I'm, this is my persuasion. Before that, there was just political games, agreements, disagreements with Hitler and military conflicts that had occurred before the 22nd of June 1941. These were local battles, tactical battles, 
and attacks. And the real resistance to fascism began on the 22nd of June 1941 and ended when the Soviet flag was raised in Berlin. And I hope this should become a memento for all of those in the East and in the West who shy away from a dialogue. Because this is a dangerous notion that could end badly. And I would like to say a couple of words uh, as a follow-up to what Mr. Klimat and Mr. Nikonov spoke about. They said that the parliament adopted a decision on uh, about European Parliament adopting a decision on the beginning of the World War when uh, German, German forces and uh, Soviet army entered Poland. I must say that not everybody thinks that. I was born in Czechoslovakia. Now it's Slovakia. For Czechoslovakia, the war began after the Munich Agreement. It was after the Munich Agreement that Germany, Hungary and Poland in the north attacked Czechoslovakia. And from my point of view, that's when our war began. And when some people say that some countries are forgetting and want to remove monuments. I can tell you that I'm a Slovakian MEP in Slovakia. We respect liberators, the Red Army, their monuments are intact in Slovakia. Nobody, nobody wants to remove them. We have flowers by the monument, and I must say that I liked very much when Mr. Nikonov said that Europe from Vladivostok to Lisbon, from uh, North Baltic and to the South, he was right, because if there won't be any dialogue in Europe and there issues won't be resolved through a dialogue or based on military actions, Europe will not have peace and there will be good for Europe or others. I'm speaking Russian, and I don't know whether I speak well or not, but I hope that you understood me very well, you speak extremely well. Not all MEPs, not MEPs are insisting on revising history. We have quite a few, quite a lot, unfortunately, less than the majority who know history, who respect the people who lived through the Second World War, who suffered the Second World War, and for whom the history cannot be revised. But this is all I wanted to say. This is all. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Miroslav. And uh, we heard veterans, the veterans, unfortunately, Julia Parsons from the United States, from the US, she's 100 years old, and this morning she informed us that she's not feeling well and she wouldn't be able to participate, but we wish her health and uh, to be a champion and though among those who are over 100 and uh, 
We heard, we listened to diplomats, politicians, and now the floor to to experts, not politicians. We see here people who represent uh, the countries of the anti-Hitler coalition. We asked Bill Bowring, professor of Burbank College of the University of London and Oksana Gaman Galutvina, who is a member of the Russian Academy of Sciences, who represents the Moscow Institute of International Relations. So Bill Bowring is head of Human Rights Defense Center and a great expert in human rights and uh, European law, all European law, and uh, an expert with the uh, European Court of Human Rights. Bill, I know that your Russian is very good. I don't know what language you're going to speak. I hope you are not upset with me that I presented you in Russian, but we are going to give the floor to you. And then we'll honor Oksana with giving her the last spot on our program. Thank you very much. Bill, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Tatiana. And I'm going mostly speak English so that I would not make any mistakes, but I'm starting in Russian. And I'm very grateful to you for your invitation several days ago to this meeting. And I must say that for the second time I represent you at the European Court of Human Rights. The first time where it was a failure, we won at the first stage and uh, in the second round we lost several years ago, but I wanted to start my presentation in Russian because I received two photographs in the chat because the first photograph is of my father who died 33 years ago. He uh, the second photograph is the it is the Soviet War Memorial in London. And I'm pleased to say that it is still there. Every year there is a ceremony, or more than one ceremony, with the Russian ambassador, with Russian military officers, with uh, veterans of the anti-Hitler coalition. And that memorial next to the Imperial War Museum was erected by the Society for Cooperation in Russian and Soviet Studies, uh, of which I am the president and we've had uh, connections with Tatjana in the past as well. So I'm very glad to put those two um, photographs on the chat. So where I'm going to start <clears throat> is by the fact that once again this year and last year, uh, the population of the United Kingdom are told that Britain won the Second World War. Um, first of all, uh, I always make it very clear that the Second World War was won by the Soviet Union. Uh, it was the Soviet Union that defeated Hitler's armies in the East, the Soviet Union which got to Berlin uh, first, and <clears throat> it was the Soviet Union which suffered enormous casualties. We were being told that it was much more than 20 million. Um, who died in the war against Nazism. Uh, Britain lost, I think, 300,000. So just comp compare those figures. Um, 
Also, however, there has been one of several films recently uh, called The Darkest Hour about Churchill in 1939-40. And that film shows very clearly that, hit, that uh, Churchill, under the influence of Lord Halifax, who was the foreign minister at that time, came very close to approaching Mussolini uh, to be a go-between with Hitler for a deal between uh, Britain and Germany. And the nature of the deal would be that Hitler would not touch the British Empire and in return, Britain would give support to Germany in its attack on the Soviet Union. So that was very clear for everybody to see in that film. What uh, is gradually becoming clear is that in the course of the war, even if British casualties were pretty low, um, terrible war crimes were committed by Britain under the leadership of Churchill. Uh, just two examples. One was the bombing of the German cities, uh, the firestorms at Dresden, the complete destruction of Cologne, um, the destruction of Bremen, all of which were revenge. They had nothing to do with war aims. And those are war crimes as understood in international criminal law. <clears throat> Furthermore, Churchill was directly responsible um, for genocide in Bengal when food was diverted from Bengal to Britain and three million people died as a direct result of Churchill's actions. So we're also learning these days about the <clears throat> uh, complications to say the very least of Britain in the, uh, what we call the Second World War. However, um, and this is really uh, with the encouragement of Tatiana, um, my father, whom I mentioned a moment ago, fought right through the war uh, from 1939 until 1945 and didn't return to Britain at all. So he was first of all in France, and people here might have heard of Dunkirk, uh, when by a miracle, the British Army, British Expedition, Expeditionary Force in France, uh, which had been surrounded by the Germans, lost all its equipment. Nonetheless, most of the British soldiers and some French were rescued between May and June of 1940. And so my father was there. Then he was one of the British soldiers put back into France by Churchill after Dunkirk. And this is not so very well known. And he was in Normandy at a time when Churchill was trying to reach agreement with France to unify France and Britain under the British king, under the British monarch. So my father was twice in France. Then he fought all the way through North Africa uh, when, of course, the Nazis wanted to take the Suez Canal and to stop oil from getting uh, to Britain. And the Nazis uh, under Rommel very nearly got to uh, Egypt and were eventually defeated, however. And then my father fought all the way through Italy. And at the end of the war, he was in the northern part of Italy on the border with Yugoslavia. And in particular, he was at the Battle of Monte Cassino, which was not the Eastern Front, of course, but I think it was one of the hardest fought and bloodiest battles against the Nazis in Italy. And my father very rarely talked about the war. He was awarded the Military Cross, which is the second highest decoration a British soldier can receive. And it took me a long time to find the citation as to why he had been awarded that very, um, very high uh, decoration for courage and gallantry. But it was at the Battle of Monte Cassino. What he did tell us, or told me, was that in those battles in Italy, 
he was fighting together with two uh, forces in particular. One was Sikhs, Indian soldiers. And my father told me that the Sikhs are the best soldiers in the world, much better than British soldiers. And Sikhs to this day have gone. So where did the Sikhs come from? They came from India. So there were soldiers from all over the British Empire uh, fighting alongside British troops uh, in every campaign during the British actions in the Second World War. He also, though, said he was fighting alongside a Polish regiment. And he said that the Poles are the bravest soldiers. He said it's quite dangerous to be with them because they have no fear. They are frightened of nothing. Whereas the British soldier will try to keep out of the way of bullets, the Polish soldiers charge forward. And it's not uh, also terribly well known that um, nearly 200,000 Polish soldiers, sailors and airmen fought alongside Britain. It was the third largest force against Hitler after the Soviet Union uh, and Britain was the, the Poles. And um, speaking of Poles, so 195,000 Poles fought alongside the British against the Nazis. And of course, many of those Poles um, escaped from Poland. And that brings me to my first, my girlfriend at university. Her name was Grazina Baran, so a Polish girl. And her father was a communist in the eastern part of Poland. And of course, um, the I know that uh, this is a highly controversial subject, but I warned Tatiana that I would mention it. And that is the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact of the 17th of, of um, September, 1939. And Grazina's father was one of many Poles who fled from Eastern Poland when it was occupied by the Soviet Union. At the same time, as of course the three Baltic states were also occupied by the Soviet Union under a secret pact entered into at that time. And um, I know one isn't supposed to mention the name of Lenin these days. And the uh, President Putin has denounced Lenin as being a German spy who destroyed the Russian Empire for money and laid an atomic bomb under the Soviet Union. And uh, Lenin is supposed to be responsible, therefore, for the greatest tragedy of the 20th century, uh, the downfall of the USSR. And of course, what uh, President Putin particularly attacks Lenin for was the federative principle and the right of nations to self-determination, on which I've written quite a lot. And of course, the three Baltic states, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, became independent in 2019 in accordance with Lenin's um, principle of the right of nations to self-determination. So they also were occupied in 1939. And in fact, uh, Grazina's father joined the Royal Air Force. And in the Battle of Britain, <clears throat> when Hitler very nearly defeated Britain, and that was in July to October of 1940. The Polish squadrons flying alongside the British squadrons, the Polish airmen, were the bravest and had the highest rate of uh, shooting down uh, German planes. And so her father had played a heroic role in the Second World War and uh, he was, by the time I was, uh, uh, had a relationship with his daughter, he was living in Bradford in the north of England, where there were 60,000 uh, Poles, uh, many of whom had come from Poland after the division of Poland in 1939. And he was the baker for the Polish community in Bradford. So, 
Um, I really do insist that historical accuracy is very important. And um, we've heard a number of accounts. I, uh, first of all, uh, the Molotov Ribbentrop Pact did happen, did happen. And it cannot be denied. I don't think it caused the Second World War. The cause of the Second World War was Hitler's aggression. Uh, first of all, in Austria, then in Czechoslovakia, and two years after the Ribbentrop Molotov Pact, when he attacked the Soviet Union. And of course, that was Hitler's downfall. And one of um, the speakers before me, I forget who, said that Stalin did some bad things. In my opinion, uh, and it's a historical record, Stalin did some terrible things. Um, first of all, I think the pact with uh, Hitler was a huge mistake. I don't think there was any justification. And uh, just before the attack by Nazi Germany in 1941, Stalin ordered the execution of nearly half of the officers of the Red Army. And uh, the Soviet Union was not prepared when Hitler attacked. And it's also very well known that um, uh, there was a lot of intelligence reaching Stalin that the Nazis were about to attack and he didn't believe it. And that was why the Nazis were able to surround Leningrad get to the outskirts of Moscow and almost get uh, to Stalingrad. So it was the heroism of the Soviet people, despite the um, huge mistakes of Stalin, which enabled the Nazi Germany to be defeated. Now, all of those are matters of historical record. So I just uh, end by saying, again, that it was the Soviet Union which won the Second World War. Britain played a very minor part in comparison to the Soviet Union. When the British people are told that Britain won the Second World War, it's a lie. Uh, when Brit British people are told that only Nazis committed war crimes, well, Churchill and Air Marshal Harris should also have been tried at Nuremberg, but they weren't, of course. And only now is the truth about the British Empire and Britain's role in the Second World War becoming more widely known. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Bill. And we know that disputes between historians and uh, political analysts continues. What is um, discutable? It's the heroism of uh, Soviet people and of those of anti-Nazi coalition but, who fight it, who fight it, Hitler you know, and... My father's friends were killed. Yeah. That was why and, he uh, would never talk about the war. Uh, he was... Uh, one thing, sorry, I, I promised uh, you to Chandra, I would say, is towards the end of his life, I translated, my father's life, I translated the play by Boris Vasiliev, Zavtrop with a Vainar. Uh, yeah. Tomorrow was war when it played at the National Theatre in London. And the yeah, author, yeah. Aris Vasiliev, came to London and he met my father. My father spoke no Russian. Aris Vasiliev spoke no English, but they were both tankisti. They were fighting in tanks. They immediately understood and recognized each other. But my father was quite a few times the only person left alive in a tank. Sorry. Thank you. Yes, yes, and we all remembering now our parents, our fathers, mothers, and we are very happy that veterans are with us. And uh, but the dispute continues, and uh, I don't know intention of Oksana to contest Bill's assertions. Uh, assertions, uh, it's up to you, and. Uh, you have honorable place as a, to conclude our sequence of speakers of our interventions today. We have time. We, we have time till eight, uh, six thirty by Brussels 
time, so still 25 minutes. So we, we, we will have, also we have um, a lot of followers and there are possibilities also for questions. So Oksana, floor is yours. Oksana Galan Gaman Galutvina, professor of Moscow International Affairs uh, University. Dear Tatiana Arkadyevna, dear participants, it my, it's my great pleasure and great honor to take the floor in the framework of such symbolic discussions. And thank you so much for the invitation. So um, I will continue uh, in Russian. Um, the previous speakers shed life on the uh, on the historical dimensions of this topic. I'm going to speak about met metaphysics. Aristotle proposed metaphysics for description of post-event cluster and i believe that its metaphysical dimensions were meant by alexander twardovsky who participated in the uh, great patriotic war who as a poet after in the post-war times went back into in his memory to those of his comrades who didn't come back from the war and i be and i and uh, he this uh, marvelous poem on the day when the war finished and uh, in short the interpreter can translate very very concisely what that poem says because it's very poetic so we cannot forget the memories of that time that historical moment 12 years more or less from 1933 till 45 at the same time, there are different uh, uh, initial points that were mentioned by uh, Mr. Nikonov, but in any case, this brief period contains very meaningful moments of history and revealed what had been hidden from observers and thinking about this period could reflect the post-classical picture of the world where space and time are non-linear and uh, genesis uh, could contain phylogenesis these 12 years included the concentration of meanings the coexistence of of extreme infinality and uh, extreme wholeness why speak about wholeness because mass heroism was uh, similar to the courage of early christians because such heroes as zor kosmetimianske and others they were martyrs for their faith for their victory of life over darkness light over darkness and this is why at that period in in time the existentialism was created and uh, Karl Jankers in his uh, publication in 1949 wrote that the width and the depth of all types of life transformations our epoch has a decisive importance and of course he didn't speak about just the framework of a decade but it's very clear that the nucleus the core of the history of the first half of the 20th centuries was the second world war this 12 years is the time that revealed the meaning of existence and we it became clear that evil and good are changing in the soviet union though the the soviet union was a country of victorious atheism the soviet people followed in the steps of christ on earth and you will read erich maria remark and uh, such as shadows in paradise night in lisbon etc what this his books are speaking about 
His heroes are trying to escape the mystical forces that are trying to catch them. They run from one European country to another, then they reach Portugal, but this internal force reaches them and catches up with them. And uh, this is what was broken, destroyed by Soviet soldiers. And uh, we can't find a better evidence of such metaphysics than the symbolism of the days. The Second World War ended on the date of the Orthodox uh, Easter and the, on the 28th, the famous with its uh, uh, extreme tortures, uh, Berlin prison was captured. And uh, with Sunday, we see the end of this, uh, the Great Patriotic War ended on Easter. The 6th of May is the day of uh, George, the victorious and uh, Marshal Zhukov wore the same name, Georgi, George. So it's the symbolism of the Second World War. And why some so actively are trying to revise the uh, Second World War and the reasons for it, the causes of it, the political history knows several uh, political ideologies, communism, liberalism, fascism, but all others are their derivatives. The first two of these ideologies are undergo not their best times, but the nature doesn't like vacuum, which is being filled with na Nazi na Nazism and uh, fascism and nationalism. And uh, now we are facing new fascism and we see the birth of new fascism and nationalism, the sources that fed the events of 80, hundred, uh, of 80 years ago. And uh, this is supported by the same forces whose, uh, whose back was broken by the Soviet soldier in 1945. And their heirs continue that fight. Many of the speakers spoke about their own experience of fighting in the war and also the, their parents fighting that war, the father of uh, Mr. Nikonov and uh, the father of Mr. Zdanoka, my great father, grandfather also uh, from Ukraine to Prague. And after the war, he met uh, Ludwig Svoboda several times because he was his comrade in arms. But unfortunately, I do not see a forthcoming break uh, to our struggle because these threatening tendencies are not going away. A new, a new, new things are happening. In uh, 1919, several months after the end of the First World War, Oswald Spendler appalled its contemporaries with uh, his reply whether a new world war is possible. He said, yes, not just it's possible, but it's unavoidable. And he explained his position and he gave a focus. Within 20 years, a new world war will take place. And actually, he even made, didn't even make a mistake just by a couple of years. And he explained his position. Within 20 years, a new generation will grow who are not aware of the uh, horrors of war and um, UN and other institutions created as a result of the victory in the Second World War ensured that there would be no new wars. But now three generations followed and the memory of the horrors of war uh, that uh, mm, 
I don't remember them and uh, the famous phrase that there are things that are more important than peace now sounds like almost a reality and uh, this uh, audience also uh, de discussed this at one of the forums fora organized by uh, Ms. Zdanoka, there are different wars uh, fought now, biological weapons, diplomatic we cyber weapons, uh, um, and uh, information weapons, and other ways to influence people. And uh, for conceptualization of the, uh, of the modern wars, we should look at the operational con concept of the U.S. Army 2040. And uh, this is a new document that reflects a new image of war. For the first time, it says that the cruel wars of the future will happen in unknown conditions and unfamiliar surroundings. And uh, there will be, uh, the opponents will be unfamiliar, who will be involved with unfamiliar and unknown alliances. So there will be things that we know that we don't know them. There is known unknown, but there is also unknown unknown, the things that we don't know that we don't know them. So very important feature of the new war concepts is the blurred frontier between war and peace when, there, when participants of conflicts become variable and uh, uh, whether the peace is war or war is peace, that's what happens and the former uh, the former uh, chief of uh, the U.S. contingent in Afghanistan, General Barna, said that the time will come when we won't be able to clearly determine when the war started or when it ended. And under the, uh, and then this means that there will be regular uh, units fighting each other, private units fighting each other, and other structures. And these and other transformations require very serious conceptual thinking and analysis, because otherwise they could come a serious obstacle on the way of political analysis. So we should rethink the experience of the Second World War or of the modern collisions, but taking into account the experience of the Second World War. Unfortunately, we have to admit that Hegel was right, that the experience and history teach that peoples and governments never learn lessons of history, and they don't draw lessons from it. And our countryman Vasily Klyuchevsky repeats that idea. History is not a teacher, but an observer. It doesn't teach much, but it severely punishes for the lessons unlearned. Unfortunately, this remains topical nowadays. Thank you very much for your invitation. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was very interesting to finish this part of our meeting, the history really teaches us that it doesn't teach us much, though they, we, called, uh, we called our meeting Lessons of History. Uh, we have a bit of time left and I am asking my assistants whether we have anyone willing to ask a question. No, there are no questions in the chat. You may raise your hand in the system or Zoom. I'm very happy that Mr. Metlock is with us uh, still and just I just wanted to, to pause you. A question, how, how do you estimate just from the, this 
view of today of 80 years since, since Nazi Germany started offensive to the East, the meeting between Biden and Putin, what, what does it show by you, your opinion? Are you satisfied with the outcome or, or not? as a former ambassador. I think situations are quite different today. First of all, but I do think that uh, by ending the meeting and uh, committing themselves to trying to find areas where we cooperate, is very encouraging because I do believe that our uh, the needs to cooperate are much more important to our future uh, than the problems we have. I think those problems uh, in the relationship uh, should uh, be dealt with by uh, understanding and compromise. Uh, but the big things facing us. Uh, dealing with the pandemic, dealing Но, with uh, global warming, pandemia, dealing with all of the dislocations in the world, the refugees, вот these many things. Бежицы, not any of these can be solved by military force, and not any of them can be solved by one of our countries alone. We have to start concentrating on what unites us. Uh, rather than what divides us. I think and I hope we're starting to do that. And uh, are there think forceful think tanks in the United States uh, sharing your position on Cold War and uh, on who was battled and, and who not during the Cold War? Your position, think tanks. Uh, I have heard your last discussion in Kinsey Institute conducted by Anatoly Levin. Yeah. I think the Cold War was uh, a, uh, basically a contest uh, between uh, the Marxist Leninist philosophy and the idea that uh, uh, there was going to be a world revolution uh, and all countries would become either socialist or later communist. I think that was the basis of uh, the thing. I think that it ended uh, when uh, uh, Mikhail Gorbachev stopped considering the, uh, uh, the interests of the proletariat uh, the primary interest, and that rather uh, that we needed to cooperate to create a common European home and to eliminate the threat of nuclear weapons. These were big ideas. Uh, they were, uh, we made important progress toward them. Uh, we're not making as much progress today, and I think that's a mistake. Thank you. And I see in the chat the question in Russian. Uh, I guess it's just for Oksana. What would you recommend to those who live in Latvia and who feel uh, the uh, nationalistic poli uh, policy of the state on themselves, the effect of the nationalist policy on themselves. We were speaking about uh, the, this nationalistic policy is replacing that. I believe that there is a reply to uh, this question not coming from me, but in your activities, people who are work in very difficult conditions for fighting for the rights of non-citizens, humanistic and Christian values there, because they have a common basis for that. It's positive values, values of good, of life, the terminology. And I'm continuing to speak in the same way as I spoke previously. Uh, could be different, but I believe that countering fascism, that's the common feature that could consolidate 
people of uh, this common denominator could consolidate people of different views, opinions, who could unite uh, liberals and socialists and uh, conservatives, because fascism is an antipode of all uh, other ideologies. It's uh, a relative of socialism, but uh, for all other ideologies, it's an anti thesis. And I believe that fighting fascism, that could uh, serve the issue of, uh, uh, that could serve the consolidation. Miroslav, you're still connected. So why there is such a difference? Because you spoke about Czech Republic and uh, Slovakia in Prague, they're removing the monument to to Konev, yeah. but in Slovakia, their attitude is very different. So what can you say about no, this attitude and it, it their a, a, fascist a, revanchism? I can't say where this issue stems from. I can only speak about Slovakia. We didn't have the same issue when there was uh, Czechoslovakia. In Slovakia, we don't have such issues. We believe, we know that we know what we feel, we know what we know in Slovakia. But in Czech Republic, this is the mood these are the moods expressed by politicians because their moods is a problematic thing altogether. I can say about my colleagues, as of uh, 2004, we are members of the European Parliament, but many members of uh, European Parliament differing their opinions from me. Everything depends on the political attitude. There are people who sort of pro-American. I don't want to speak really about that, but uh, they believe that they don't uh, agree with many things. And I believe that in uh, Czech Republic, it's a political decision. If uh, there were a referendum in Czech Republic, and if people decided this wouldn't have happened. So this is a political issue, not people's issue. Because, you know, in Slovakia, we don't have this problem. And uh, but this is a wrong path when somebody wants to divide Europe into East, West, because where is that? But we should ask who doesn't want to trade this is an economic issue. Um, interpreter apologizes. There is a very strong echo all of a sudden and uh, interference coming from the speaker. This is an economic issue, but this is not a European issue. This is an issue prompted by another country, but let's not start discussing it now and speak about this third party. And I don't think there's going to be a third party, but politicians, politicians who are unable Nabel to live in this Europe, that there could be a hegemon in Europe, we should cooperate, they should understand that. And I heard the words of the former ambassador in the Soviet Union. And I remember Gorbachev, and I remember Perestroika, and I remember how they were speaking about uh, 
Uh, a unified European home. They spoke about peace in the world. And uh, what happened when? Then, and uh, and uh, it's bad when uh, sanctions sanctions begin, when uh, problems begin, and uh, this is wrong. But I believe that if I were not certain of all these things, then I believe in this, not in words, and we should speak in the European Parliament that all Europe should unite. And uh, I believe that this is what is going to happen in the future. And I believe that the good will win over bad. So I have to conclude our, our webinar and uh, return back to the be its beginning. And first of all, I want to thank Mr. Biden Hall and Mrs. Hall. Thank you. I hope you hear me. Thank you very much for your participation and your memories you shared with us. Uh, you see, I am coming from Riga and uh, Riga, uh, a writer, famous writer, Valentin Pikul, lived for many years, uh, all years after the war, and he devoted, and he was member and uh, of Arctic, Arctic battles, and uh, his we know about them from his his uh, tales he he wrote, he created. Thank you very much. Большое спасибо, Александр. Thank you so much to Mr. Asopian for his, for your stories, for your ex about your experience, how you walked through Europe and Asia. Thank you, Mr. Matlock. Thank you very much. I hope very much that we will meet again. Yeah. And uh, as, as we have heard all, there are a lot of questions to debate and a lot of things to do. Thanks, uh, Miroslav. Thanks, uh, uh, Bill Boring. Thanks, Oksana, and those who are still watching uh, from the offices of Ambassador and members of State Duma. Thanks to my assistants who helped a lot with this meeting. Oh, good evening to and good afternoon to Mr. Metlock <laughs> and good evening to all the Europeans. And I hope we'll, I see you again. We will, and maybe someone of you will invite also us to, to discussion. All the best. <laughs>